It's 10 o'clock here, uh, Pacific time, uh, top of the hour wherever you are. Um, and I just want to welcome everybody to the web seminar entitled Peer Mentoring, Recruiting, Training, and Ensuring Longevity. I'm Mike Geringer here at the Mentoring Resource Center offices in Portland, Oregon. Uh, as many of you know, the MRC is the training and technical assistance provider for those of you who are Department of Education grantees. And I'm joined here today by Eric Stiefvater from the LEARNS project. Uh, Eric will be manning the WebEx controls today. Uh, LEARNS is funded by the Corporation for National and Community Service to provide training and technical assistance to its grantees working in tutoring, mentoring, out-of-school time, and other youth development areas. Uh, we're also joined today by our presenter, Tina Christensen, who is at our offices at the Big Brothers uh, Big Sisters of Greater Rochester up in New York State. Um, and I'll be formally introducing Tina and letting her get going here in just a minute, but I want to go over a few housekeeping items here today that I think will help our presentation go a little more smoothly. Uh, we have at least 100 participants with us today, so a big group, um, and almost all of you are from two major kind of program groups, U.S. Department of Education mentoring grantees, and also programs and individuals sponsored by the Corporation for National and Community Service. So regardless of how you came to the world of mentoring, uh, welcome to this training, and I hope that we can provide you with some valuable information today. Uh, now that we're into the presentation a little bit, you should be able to see us moving through the slides in the main panel of the WebEx interface. Um, there are some participatory tools on the right-hand side of the screen as well. And we'll be keeping the use of those to a minimum today. There will be a few opportunities for you to use the WebEx system and interact a little bit, and we'll be explaining those as we get to them. Uh, the main presentation today should take about an hour, but we're going to try and include some time for Q&A at the end of Tina's talk. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll use the Q&A feature in WebEx, so keep any questions that you have handy until the end, and then we'll explain how to submit them at that time. If you're unable to get your, if we're unable to get to your question during today's session, uh, please know that you can give us a call or send us an email for some one-on-one -on -one assistance. Uh, I think Tina is also going to take a little time to try and respond to questions that are submitted that we just don't have time to address in person here today. Uh, so, you know, whatever your needs are around peer mentoring, be sure to let us know after the fact um, if there's still additional information you need that wasn't covered here today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're keeping everyone's phones on mute throughout the presentation today. If you're having any technical difficulties, you can contact Kay Logan here at our offices at 503 275-0135. Um, if you're unable to connect to WebEx or, you dis get, or if you get disconnected, your internet connection goes down, for instance, uh, you can always follow along using a copy of the slides that we sent out yesterday. Um, and as we go through the presentation, we'll make sure to note which slide we're discussing as we move through it. Uh, and finally, I just want to let everyone know right off the bat, we're going to be sending out a brief anonymous online survey after the session. We'll be providing you a link uh, via email. And I just want to you know, thank everybody in advance for filling that out when we send it. Um, those really evaluation results really help us um, streamline and improve these web seminars and make sure that, that your needs and the needs of your colleagues are met. So now that all that housekeeping stuff is out of the way, Let's go ahead and dive into the presentation. Uh, as many of you know, cross-age peer mentoring is an increasingly popular way of supporting young people in a variety of academic, developmental, and social areas. And while we know a great deal about uh, adult youth mentoring, research and best practices are still emerging when it comes to a cross-age peer mentoring model. And that's why we are so lucky to have our presenter, Tina Christensen, with us here today. Tina is the Director of Programs at the Big Brothers Big Sisters of Greater Rochester, an agency that operates one of the most successful peer mentoring programs in the country. She oversees programming in an eight-county region of upstate New York, serving over 700 youth annually. She's been in the mentoring field for eight years and is responsible for grant writing, staff management, and program oversight. Uh, Tina was responsible for the creation of their peer mentoring program, and she's currently working with the National Big Brothers Big Sisters office to develop a demonstration project for peer mentoring. So we are very lucky to have her expertise with us today. Before I turn things over to Tina, I just want to take a minute to gauge the level of experience that all of you have today running a peer mentoring program. 
system. I feel you know, learning a little bit about where you all are at um, can help Tina tailor her presentation a bit to reflect your level of experience. And it can let Eric and myself know some of the areas that you all might need follow-up support in. So as you can see, uh, Eric has gone ahead and opened up a poll here on the right-hand side of WebEx. So please take a minute to uh, go ahead and click the option that applies to your program. Um, and we'll go ahead and see how experienced all of you are in the, the world of peer mentoring. OK, results are coming in now. I also want to mention, just while people are filling out the poll, that we're going to be showing a number of handouts today. Um, and we want, I want you to know that those handouts are going to be available um, via email and also for downloading on our website uh, once this presentation is done. So if you see something and you're like, oh, I really want a copy of that, don't worry. We'll be getting you uh, uh, electronic copies of everything that we show you today. So, okay, let's just take another minute here, see if anyone's filling out the poll further. Okay. I think that's about good. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the results here. Okay, it looks like we have a lot of folks that are less than a year in, into peer mentoring or between one and three years, so uh, kind of a, a new group to the world of peer mentoring, and I think uh, Tina's presentation today will have plenty of useful information for you, um, regardless of your level of experience. But for those of you just getting started, I think Tina's going to really cover uh, some of the core concepts and some of the, the most important aspects of running a peer mentoring program. So. Without further ado, uh, go ahead and take it away, Tina. Well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate very much the invitation to be here today. I've, uh, I've worked in the mentoring field for a number of years and just have a real passion for mentoring. However, as, as Michael said, uh, peer mentoring has really been my baby. It was the introduction I had to this field, and it is the, the area that I really have found a, a tremendous amount of growth in, in our agency. I hope I can assist you today with some tools that will help with your programs. And I really would love to see this model just grow across the nation. If I, it, it really is a model that, that I really embrace. So I see by the survey, as Michael said, that a lot of you are fairly new to the peer mentoring program. And welcome. It, uh, you'll find it to be a lot of fun. I plan to discuss areas of peer mentoring that are likely to be staples in your program, but try to give you some additional support that will help you uh, ensure the life of your program beyond the, the time of your grant. So let's first look at the model on slide five that, that we're using. We've had this uh, model for over eight years, and the project design is now implemented in 15 schools. We began with four schools and one staff to oversee those programs, and have now have grown to the 15. Through this program, we serve over 600 youth annually. We have one district that has uh, two programs running at the same time. So on that day of the week, in two areas of that building, we have two programs going on. And in our Rochester City program, we have two new programs here. We expect that that is going to be the, the largest growth that we see over the next few years. We're going to launch a brand new project in a small, small rural community this year. And that is going to be part of that project that uh, Mike talked about with Big Brothers Big Sisters National. Our programs are all supervised. Um, we cap our programs at 20 matches, so about 40 youth in the program um, in the room at one time. And they're supervised by our staff. We chose to supervise the program due to the risk. We can't background a, a minor, as you know, as we do an adult mentor. So we chose to remove as much risk as possible and supervise the program. We typically recruit 10th and 11th graders in the first or second year of a program when we start, and then we add 9th graders later. We won't match a 12th grader for the first time. We'll keep a 12th grader that's been in the program matched as if they come in at 10th or 11th grade and stay into their senior year, but we won't take them as a new match as in 12th grade. It just does not ensure that longevity. It doesn't make the match retention that we'd like to see. Our programs meet one day a week for about an hour and a half after school, and we do not meet in the summer. Um, however, the schools do get together over the summertime for large field trips. 
we tried to run the programs um, during the summertime in the first two years and just did not find it successful. We had a very low amount of students that were coming on a regular basis. As you see by um, our definition of the kids that we're using, we choose a very different population of high school students than most programs do. We began this pilot program in 1999, specifically excluding what have, would have been a traditional minor from, mentor for most people. The four schools that we were working with wanted to meet a population of kids that were not being served, a disconnected population. So the next slide you look at looks at that uh, definition of disconnected. These students are not the high achievers. They're also not students who need intervention. They're not the kids who are receiving services from the school, both extracurricular or intervention. But they're youth that when they're given a spotlight, have really proven to us an incredibly effective mentor. Uh, we found that we were able to change the pattern of behaviors in these mentors that had led them, would have led them to a higher risk. It, this group has really been very successful for us. As you see, see in slide seven, there's a, a real benefit to this population. You are able to measure both participants. Um, you can have significant outcomes on both participants. And you'll be able to get funding uh, from grants and foundations to serve both. So you can count both of those youth as being served in that funding source. We've also found this population to provide a longer match length. Many of you are familiar with an impact study that's coming out from Big Brothers Big Sisters on, on peer mentoring programs. We expect that the results of that are going to be released this fall. The study shows, among other things, that their match retention rate is only about five months. This was terribly disappointing for us. Um, we came to understand it was likely because of their use of the high achiever. Our research that we conducted shows a very different result using a disconnected student. We did a three-year-long research study on the original pilot program when we used a control group. Our researcher, the gentleman that we had hired for this project, um, for the SICA study that we were doing, asked that we also measure the high school student using the same tools that we were using for our mentees. We did, reluctantly, uh, knowing that it was going to be twice as much data that we were going to be collecting. The results were just phenomenal. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that our high school students had a significant result in all four of these areas measured. We were especially surprised at the risk and protective factors. Risk factors are um, things that uh, kids can become involved in that increase the likelihood that they're going to engage in risky behaviors. And protective factors are the circumstances that promote healthy behaviors. The youth that we were specifically targeting as mentors, the disconnected, had a much higher risk factor and much lower protective factors. At the end of the third year, we surveyed the whole school. We did the survey and we added a question and asked if they were involved in the mentoring program. We got back to the exact same number of results for the kids who were in the program that we anticipated. And what we find was that, that the kids that were in the mentoring program had increased, in, they showed improvement in 35, <laughs> I apologize, the kids that we had involved in the program had improved in 33 of the 35 factors, so just a, a phenomenal result. It was at that time, too, that we sort of popped ourselves on the forehead and recognized this should have been something we anticipated would have happened. We chose the, them specifically. We asked them to be mentors. We trained them. We spent nearly every week providing individual support to them. And in a lot of ways, our staff persons mentored them. And that time before their mentees uh, got to the program, had conversations with them about how their mentoring relationships were. We really should have uh, noticed that there was going to be a significant change in this population. That research for us was so phenomenal that we were able to use that for future funding. And it has allowed all of the growth that we have had in our program. So let's look at the recruitment and screening of your high school mentors. On slide 10, if we look at uh, the topic of recruitment, we can see an effective recruitment plan ensures the right mentors in the room 
and they'll help to ensure the longevity of that mentor. A good plan will also keep you on target and ensure that the project gets off the ground in a timely manner. You'll be able to recruit to be able to uh, get more students, but if you set a deadline for that recruitment plan, get your program up and running, and then add students at a later time, um, having that plan in place will make sure that, that, take, that your program gets up. We've had a number of tough lessons over the year through recruitment, and the next slide talks about those lessons and what we find really did not work for, for recruiting. As in any mentoring program, even in peer mentoring programs, sometimes the challenge is finding a mentor. The methods here are some that we have tried. We have done uh, table and room recruitments, and they've been unsuccessful for a few reasons. This is where you may um, set up at a, at a lunch or go into a study hall and ask a, a large group if they'd like to become involved in your programs. We tend to get a lot of enthusiasm from this, but really no follow through. We also found that a group would come and sign up together. So they would sign up as a group, and they would come to program as a group, and they would mentor as a group. We never really saw them have one-to-one -one relationships with their mentors. And what we also found, too, was that when one of them quit, we lost the whole group. We also found it ineffective to go after the high achiever. As I talked about the research that's coming up from, from the national organization, um, it, it completely reinforced what we knew. These students are incredibly good mentors, but they're far too busy. They mean well, they want to be there, but with sports and theater and often jobs, they can't meet that one-year commitment to their mentee. During interview process, they are sure that they'll be able to find the time, but then at the point where the mentoring programs are up and running, um, we see their, their participation drop off. Very good-hearted, very well-meaning, but just not able to make that a commitment. They start off very strong, but we often lose them after the holidays. Lastly, every time that we strayed from what was the fundamental model of our project, we failed. We came to understand that in all aspects of the program, what were the core elements that made us succeed? What were the things that we knew made the program work very well? We were able to determine what those aspects were, we could adjust the program and other elements to meet the school, to meet the population, of the area, the region that we're working with, even the times that buses and schedules, all of those factors. But if we stayed with the core pieces, the project was very successful. Slide 12 covers the model that we found to be almost foolproof. We began with our criteria. For us, it was that disconnected population. But you can develop your own criteria of students that you want to have in your program. Look at the programs that you have now. What students have been really successful for you? Define your, their successes as your criteria. And then we took our criteria and our liaisons. Um, I'll continue to, to talk throughout this process about our school liaisons. That is our key relationship into the school. That's our point person in, in making the program work. And they vary from school district to school district to, uh, uh, to us who, who that person is. But uh, our school liaisons are the ones that do the footwork at the school programs. So in the, in the recruitment model, our liaisons take the criteria and they get it out to the teachers, to the counselors. They do it through email or through uh, their mailboxes. They then get a list of all the students that uh, the school is recommending to be involved in the program. And the liaison brings that student down one by one, and our staff offers the program. This one-to-one -one ask has really been crucial. The student begins their first step of commitment to the program with that individual ask. And with our disconnected population, they often turn around in the room and say, are you talking to somebody else because you can't be talking about me. Um, they, uh, they're very, very uh, interested in hearing more about the program at that point. We give them a synopsis of what the program is going to be like, what their role is, and the instructions for them to return their paperwork. The paperwork that we give is an application and a cover letter for parents um, to be able to contact the school or, or our staff if they have any questions about the program. It's also the permission um, that we get signed so that we can meet individually with that uh, future mentor, and they bring that back to the liaison. 
this is the beginning of the screening process for them because if they can't remember to bring the, pro the paperwork back, they're not likely to be the students that are going to be at your program on a weekly basis. Your recruitment will continue into your screening process. So let's look at the next slide for this process. Our first screening is our interview. And for us, it's been an adaptation of the adult interview. We took very little out. Um, we probably added more questions in regards to their school life, the time they're able to commit to this program, their grades, when they anticipate graduation, those kind of questions. We still ask a lot of the sensitive questions that all of you are asking of your adult mentors, and, and we glean information um, very similar to what we would get, be getting from the adults. So with that information, know what you can't accept. We don't, as I said, accept somebody who's involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. We know it'll interfere. We don't, also don't accept someone that we know would be challenged by handling the behaviors of their mentee. So looking at that high school student who's going to be able to handle that role. I recommend that you use this time to really help the students understand what they're committing to and what they can expect from the program. Encourage them to ask questions about the activities, about your policies, ask as much as um, they'd like to learn before the match meeting. It's again another part of that screening phase. The last screening that we have is with the school. Uh, parents sign a release for their child to, to be in the program. This allows this release am among all the other releases that are on it for taking pictures and transportation and medical um, uh, support if it's needed. The release also allows us to speak to the school, and it allows us to get the school records that we use for our data collection, but it also allows that open communication with school personnel. So we ask the liaison to look at the school records. We don't look at them, them ourselves. That school liaison looks at the records to assure that this person is going to be making the right choices, that they're going to be the person that we're looking for in a mentor. That step um, is much easier for our liaisons in the second and third year. They become to know what kids are, are really the success of the program. I cannot express how much the role of the liaisons in the school administration is key to the future of your project. I wanted to talk a little bit now about how you can support that relationship. As I said, we're nearing 10 years uh, with several schools, and that wouldn't have happened without a school champion. So let's look at uh, the next slide and the importance of the relationships with the schools. Um, this, these next slides will help to provide a basic support to the development of that strong relationship. We'll look at a lot of the small steps that you can take that glean a very large buy-in from the school community. So let's first look at the relationship within the building. School champions are the key to our success. Uh, this person moves the mountains to see our program work. They understand the, the key school relationships that we need to develop. They understand building norms. They help us to bridge uh, communication breakdowns. They help us to get to students when we, we aren't uh, seeing someone coming to program. They're just absolutely essential in, in our programs uh, working. Um, we have twice left schools where we were not able to make a program work because we lost or we never had a champion there. We tried for three years in both of these schools, but we just slowly saw the deterioration of the program and, and recognized it was time for the relationship to end. It was not a, a fruitful one for either one of the parties involved. So work to establish some real good groundwork with your schools, MOUs, roles, timelines. Um, I've provided two handouts for you to use. You can look at these handouts later. You'll be getting them after the web presentation, so don't worry about the whole content of them right now. But the first one is the roles document. And this document helps to establish um, the key efforts of the programs that you need to function and who's responsible for that. Those efforts are defined by our staff and by their school staff. This document is helpful for school personnel to see what they really need to be doing and, and working on. This document also appears very overwhelming to some. Um, I recommend that you use your school liaisons from other schools that you're working with to support new ones. 
we use this document when we go in for the first time in establishing a, a new program, and it helps the administration to define who the person is that's going to be our school liaison and, and help to begin to establish what roles take place. But in looking at it, um, the school liaison who's handed this piece of paper often gets very overwhelmed by the number of tasks that are on there. So I recommend that you give them another person that they can talk to in another school who's been doing your program. And that person can, can help to define how much work it actually is. Okay, let's look at the MOU. Um, MOUs are important beyond the reasons of contractual matters of liability insurance or audits that you have done within your organization on your contract. But uh, our MOU, especially in our Department of Education grant, was crucial. Our Department of Education grant paid for the liaison position and paid for our busing throughout the, the time that we had it. Those are, are typically an in-kind donation in our programs from the school district, but because the DOE grant allowed us to do that, we were able to provide stipends for both of those. We recognized, though, that in the end of the first year, if we wanted to keep these programs going beyond the length of, of the Department of Education grant, we really needed to look at that sustainability piece and the in-kind donation of that coming from the school district. So we did, in the second year, um, put the language into our MOU that we were looking for that to become an in-kind donation from the school district. And that, in the MOU, allowed that conversation to remain open throughout the time of the grant and, and led them to the path of being able to do that. I can, uh, I can say that we're successfully sustaining all of our Department of Education schools, and we've done that through through that in-kind donation that has been given in all the districts that we began with those grants. So now looking at slide 17, the relationship with the, with, the, with the school district. I highly recommend that you use your report card. We use it in two ways. The outcomes that you're reporting are, are related to the needs of the school. Provide that report card to your school. Show them the effect that your program has had. Also, our program relies on teachers to fill out a rating form, and they fill these out pre and post. So two times a year, they're filling them out on several students within their buildings. We, uh, we measure in our high school students the four core classes. So we have uh, at least four teachers filling them out on about 20 students. And so sometimes they're very difficult for us to get returned. So we provide that uh, report card with a thank you to each one of the teachers who have filled out these rating forms. And they get to see what the effort um, they have made in filling out has had on the impact of the overall project. And they can see what impact the program has had on the school. It's been very useful for us in uh, getting back a few more forms than we had in, in previous years. I also recommend that you use every opportunity to promote the program on campus. Art, service projects, to be as visible as possible on that campus. We've planted trees for Arbor Day. We've planted gardens. Um, the students have made murals. Many of the projects that take place uh, during the program as a large group project often are, are posted throughout the school. We also use natural systems to promote the school um, that the school has already in place. One of them is and during uh, National Mentoring Month, on the morning announcements, we thank our high school mentors. They are, their names are, are read off and, and thanked for participating in the program. We use the school newsletter whenever we can get uh, articles or pictures in there. And we uh, try to get in the yearbook uh, as a high school student as a, as a club in the yearbook. One of my favorites is the senior award ceremonies. Our mentors present their graduating mentor, our mentees present their graduating mentors a rose and a certificate at that award ceremony. It is just incredibly sweet. And there it's twofold. You're hitting the community, the parents, and the people that uh, attend the school, but also the, the district admin administration. It, it really is a wonderful thing to do. I also recommend that you make presentations to your board and bring your matches. It's a great impact. We had a school district uh, last year who, after the board presentation, 
decided that they were going to add into their budget additional support to our program um, based on the presentation that was made. So before I get to the training content, I just wanted to get a sense of how all of you are currently running your peer programs and how you're handling training. I believe we have a poll at this point. Uh, yes, Tina. Uh, as you guys can see here, Eric's uh, opened up the poll on the right-hand side of your, uh, your screen. And uh, we just want to get a, a sense of the types of training you're already doing, how often, how much. Uh, so go ahead and take a minute here to, uh, to toggle some of those options and uh, click the things that apply to how you all are, are currently running your programs. Um, we'll take just a minute to do that. Also, like I mentioned earlier, I want to remind folks that all the handouts that we show, the MOU and the roles and responsibilities sheet and all that, uh, will be made available electronically after the session. And I also wanted to, to let folks know that we're working on a companion guidebook to this presentation, which is about a 40-page uh, guidebook on running a cross-age peer mentoring program. And that should be done in about a week or so. So uh, we will make sure that everybody on the call here today gets a copy of that. And we'll also have that available for download on the MRC and LEARN's websites as well. So um, we are putting the finishing touches on that. And that will have a lot of good uh, listings of training materials and books that can provide your matches with activities and things like that. So. Um, in addition to this presentation today, we've got a lot more content on cross-age peer mentoring headed your way. So give you everybody a few more seconds here to, to fill out the poll. This one takes a little bit longer to fill out, so we'll give people a little bit more time. Well, let's give people just a few more seconds. We see about 11 people haven't uh, started yet. Hopefully WebEx is doing what it should be doing, which is showing you a poll on the right-hand side of the screen. If you could just take a quick second to answer the three questions that are listed there. Okay, we'll give people just a few more seconds to answer the poll. Okay, thanks for uh, filling that out, everybody. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at our results. All right. Looks like many of you are covering the, uh, the common training areas. Most of you are doing uh, pre-match training, a little bit of individualized training. And uh, it looks like many of you are doing a good amount of training, which is, is a very good thing. I think there's some new research coming out soon that shows that the, the volume of training is a, is a, a real key consideration in working with, with peer mentors. So, Tina? I agree to uh, Michael. One of the pieces that's going to be shown in that research that's coming out is a pre-match training. As much of that can be done ensures a, a more quality match as they found through that research. So let's look at the training that, that we have been doing. We require all matchers to come to training before they're matched. So we do pre-match training. And we also do um, a post-match. So the requirement to come is, is set up during the recruitment phase. Students are given information about the training at their interview. We, we train before, a, a few weeks after the match meeting, and then throughout the year as it's needed. Our peer mentoring is, training is, is different than our adult mentoring. We adapted the model from our community-based program but, and made adjustments in, in three key areas. 
our high school mentors, as you know, have uh, less life experience. And, and they do not necessarily have the right filters at all times. As uh, all of you may have experienced at different times with your mentors, uh, that some of their filters and, and the conversations that they have with their mentees are not always appropriate. And the third thing is they're not as likely to integrate the information into practical application. So being able to take that uh, and immediately use it with the situation we have found um, needs additional support. We also use this training time to bond the members of the group. Um, they begin to rely on one another in the group for their match. They seek support, uh, create a team, and they help one another to keep the program policies in place. As I said, we're choosing that disconnected population that are coming in without a lot of peer support. And this becomes one of the, the strongest peer uh, support networks that they have through high school. You'll also see natural leaders emerge in your training, and you'll use those leaders during your activities. They're the people that you're going to come to rely on to support you with some of the, the processes that take place during your program. You'll also get a lot of insight during your training about the challenges you'll face with personalities in the program. And uh, I'll use this time, if you could have a second person in the room to be able to start to glean that information. It's difficult in facilitating and also um, catching all of those, uh, those group things that are happening. So looking at side 20, we understand the ongoing nature of training. Our training is continuous. It's really never done. We do it individually, and we do it as needed for specific issues. We've had a couple times where we needed to discuss um, a specific issue. We had a group where one school was not setting appropriate boundaries for their mentees, all of them across the board. Our staff force was in, extremely frustrated with what took place on a weekly basis. So we set a specific time to cover those issues and provided ways that they could support one, in, one another in setting boundaries. You also may need to train based on an issue that is school-wide. Your mentors may not be able to, um, to support their mentees in this topic. They might not be able to discuss an issue that is happening in the community or happening in the school that everyone is aware of. But uh, when the mentee brings it up with the mentor, they're not exactly sure what they should be saying or how they should respond to it. We had this particular issue, and uh, we found it to be a great relief to our mentors when we discussed it. I strongly suggest that you bring in your school personnel into that training. We brought in the, school, the high school counselor to that training, and she was able to support it in ways beyond our staff was able to. Lastly, use other agencies. You have a cache of human service organizations with great youth development training around you. Enlist all of them. We have a, what we call a big day in one of our counties, and that's where all the schools in that county that are in our peer mentoring programs come together. They're released from their school day. They spend a whole day in workshops um, with other human service organizations providing leadership skills, different trainings, and supports to those bigs. It is a great success. It's a wonderful event um, in that community. Training provides the peer mentor the boundaries they seek to define their role. So let's look at the agenda on the next slide. Training is after school for about two hours. We made it highly interactive. Um, I have a great team one of which breeds experiential education. We made all of our trainings interactive. The participants are up and moving around or participating in most of the training. I warn you never to make it too long. I went to a, a training once where the keynote speaker said, my job is to talk, your job is to listen, let me know when you finish first. It was a light bulb for me for the high school mentoring programs. Um, they've been in classes all day. So if your training is longer than two hours, break it up into two trainings if you need to. Another important uh, aspect that we have added to our training is what we call mentor money. So we've developed these small mentor bucks um, that they get paid for their participation. And at the end of the training, they're able to buy items. These are all promotional materials that you have around your offices um, that promote your agencies. 
and it's great to have the mentors using those in the school and, and wearing them or, or using them throughout the school years to promote the program. We have a lot of props, tools, and games, and we really feel like this approach integrates the material so much better with this population. So looking at slide 21, we'll cover the outline for training. Your agenda should be basic for your first training, you know, defining the role, assisting uh, with communication, covering much needed topics about risk, uh, discussing differences, covering your policies, and then talking about the reports that they're going to need to complete for you. Our next slide begins the training. Uh, our, our first uh, module is the role of the mentor, and it can be delivered in many different ways. As uh, Mike talked about, you'll get, be getting materials that will help you assist in your training and uh, this training role. We use art, um, building materials, collages, any media that you, you choose, and this, uh, this exercise will help them to understand their role. You're able to stress some really essential elements of mentoring while reinforcing some of the elements that you want left at the door. So in this, uh, in this exercise, we often give a large newsprint to a group, um, bro broken up the whole population into smaller groups, and they'll draw or build a mentor. You, the mentor will give you elements that they believe make a good mentor based on their own experiences, and you can add to them, stress the ones that you need to stress, or play down the ones that really are not essential. The next thing we do is hand out our mission, and we uh, break up our mission into individual words, and we do a mission jumble, and they are, put it all together and, and spell out our mission. It helps them to understand why they're there. Um, this is a time that you can share your outcomes, let them know why they're one of the people that are key to your success as an agency and the success of the young person that they're going to be mentoring. Um, let them know what the time that they're going to be spending with their mentee is going to do and how it's going to impact the, the relationship. We spend an awful, oh, on the next slide we'll talk about communication. We spend an awful lot of time on communication uh, because it has so many of elements of training within it. We use the peanut butter and jelly exercise from NWREL. If any of you are familiar with it, um, this exercise has the participants assist you in making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for the first time. And you, of course, follow the instructions precisely. So if they say, put the peanut butter on the bread, you're going to take the peanut butter with your hand and spread it across the whole loaf of plastic bread. You get the idea. It really helps to have them understand communication and how they communicate things. If you've never done it, you can use the time uh, to clean up while you're talking and, and be able to cover all the rest of the topics that you want to get to. It's highly interactive and it really charges this population in, in understanding their communication. We talk about age and child development. We remind, remind them what it's like to be the age of their mentees. We cover open communication and body language. We also talk about appropriate conversations or what we call big conversations. What are those things that you should be talking about with a high school student privately and not necessarily at the program? We also cover disclosures and confidentiality and how to handle them. We provide them with a scenario and a script. However, we're the ones who are going to be making that mandated, uh, taking on that mandated report role and making that hotline report. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about the conversations that they may have with their littles that they're going to have to share with the school or with ourselves. And we talk about uh, how to handle those conversations or what are the ones that if you leave uh, the program and come back and say, geez, I'm, I'm sure this is something that we need to discuss further. So the next slide covers diversity. And uh, there's a number of topics that you can use to cover diversity, but let's look at the ones that we're using. We use the cross the line activity. And this exercise physically moves students across the room to accentuate similarities and differences and discuss their feelings about those differences. As, uh, as Mike said earlier, we cover an eight-county region. Uh, we have a very large city in Rochester. We have a small city. We have several suburban schools. And we also have a, a large population of very rural school districts where some of the graduating classes are around 50 students. 
So we need to tailor our diversity training based on those different populations. What we would train in our, in our city school programs is very different in one of the rural school districts. Mostly here you want to help them mentor with their filters. High school students have difficulty with these, as I discussed earlier. So really helping them to understand and have empathy and be able to get a picture of, of the youth that they're going to be matched with. On slide 26, it discusses the meat of the program. This is where you're going to discuss your program policies, the day-to-day -day agenda, and the norms for the program. For instance, we have norms around getting uh, youth to the restrooms, to the bus, and we discuss all of these. We also talk about the role that our staff takes and help to define what the mentor is required to do and what our staff does. This material is typically in their handbook and sadly is the least interactive part of our program, but we cover the policies and we talk about the agreement that the high school mentors is, is going to have um, agreed to, to be in the program. So we wrap up here. Um, it's usually about all of the, that they can absorb. So the next slide talks about the ex additional topics that you can use for training. Sometimes we go back and delve into child development a little bit deeper. We discuss discipline. Um, we also might uh, talk about how the high school student can know their buttons. I recommend that you use feedback about your training um, that from your mentors. Uh, use a survey to get information about how the training went, but also engage a student who's been in your program for, for the second year to come back to the training and give you feedback about what they felt was directly applicable to their role. And you can work with your evolved students to take them into a, a little bit uh, higher level of leadership skills and enlist, again, some of the human service organizations around you that train on leadership. We have thoroughly enjoyed uh, working with our school-based programs. But they've grown to be a strong rate for us over the years and increased our annual uh, match count tremendously. At the same time, we've been able to develop strong programs based on focusing on these key elements, strong recruiting and training. Um, as a result, we have a match retention rate for our peer program now at 11 months. I'm extremely proud of what our team has done to achieve, achieve that. And they've also set a goal this year to increase that match retention rate to one year. I've included some resources on the next slide for you to use. Um, these books have been extremely helpful for us in developing our training manuals. Some of the activities uh, in these books are materials, as Mike talked about, that you'll get later. The teamwork resource has been extremely helpful for us in developing training materials and also for program activities. We use this source for staff development and the products for the matches. There's a number of activities that you can use for training and also for your match activities. And lastly, the research I spoke about earlier is available through our researcher, Rob Lilith, and he'd gladly give you a copy of that for your use. I thank you for allowing me to present today. Um, I want to extend my support to you in any way that I can be, and my contact information is here as are the hosts for your events. So, Mike, we uh, want to open this up for questions. Yes, thanks, Tina. That was uh, very, very helpful. You covered a, a lot of content there, and I'm sure folks have many questions for you. Um, as you can all see, Eric has opened up the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, if yours happens to be collapsed, you can expand it by clicking on the little arrow next to where it says Q&A there. And basically, you should be able to uh, type in your question. There is a, a character limit on those. Um, but you should be able to type in your question um, and hit send. And just a little technical note, um, if you could uh, send your question to, in the drop-down menu, host and presenter. That way, both Tina and ourselves here will be able to see that. So we'll give everybody a few minutes here to type in your questions. Uh, we'll go ahead and just kind of take them in the order that we get them. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read them to Tina in case those of you out there uh, are just following along on the slides or uh, are, are unable to see the questions from other folks. I'll go ahead and read them. So let's uh, give everybody a few minutes here to, uh, to type in a, a question. Um, while everyone's typing in, in you know, what you're curious about here, I just want to remind folks once again that uh, 
Uh, we do have many handouts from this that we're going to be sending out after the fact. You know, Tina, there was one handout that we didn't get to, and that was the, uh, the high school agreement. That's what uh, I believe the mentors sign um, to kind of define their roles and responsibilities. Would you like to talk about that just a little bit? That is a piece that we uh, provide during the, the training. It is uh, outlines what we anticipate or the expectations we have for the, the mentors. They get a copy of it. We get a signed copy. It helps to sometimes uh, bring that back around when there's challenging uh, times with the mentor relationship and, and help to remind them of, of the policies that we have in the program. Okay. Yeah, I would think that, that reminding uh, young people of, of all the expectations is, is a good way of, of getting the, what you need out of them. So it looks like we have some, some questions rolling in here, so let's go ahead and take a few. We'll, uh, we'll do Q&A up until the top of the hour here, and then uh, we'll let all of you get back on your way to uh, running your, your busy programs. Uh, Maria wants to know, do you create only same-sex matches, and is this an issue at all? We do cross-gender matches in our school-based programs. Uh, we don't do them in our community-based programs, but because we have such a higher population of females that um, volunteer to be in the school-based programs, we have been doing cross-gender matches. We typically do not do the opposite way, a big brother with a little sister, because we get a smaller rate of big brothers that come in, and they are matched very quickly with a little brother. Okay. Uh, Doreen wants to know uh, regarding transportation. You mentioned that grant money initially covered the transportation, but the school later took this on as an in-kind donation. Um, what did the transportation involve, bringing mentors to the, to the high school, or did the mentees go to the high school? How exactly does that work? It, it involved both. Uh, our, our transportation gets typically the high school mentor to the elementary building and 80 percent of our programs the the after school activity takes place at the elementary building but then we provide transportation home after the program ends in some programs we have piggybacked on their 21st century uh, transportation or, or late bus but typically the time that we want to spend is not fitting into a schedule with the buses. So we have uh, an additional bus that is just for the mentor and mentee. Okay. Jureen also wanted to ask, uh, how does this work in a school district with many elementary schools? So I'm guessing, uh, you know, a situation where you have one high school perhaps and, you know, many, many feeder schools that, that go into that. Um, I'll answer that in two different ways. We have, uh, we have that same uh, in one of our rural areas where we have a one high school with three elementary buildings and uh, we typically break up the number of spots that go to each one of those elementary buildings to be in the program. And then in our Sydney school districts, we match one elementary with one high school. So we have multiple elementary buildings and multiple high school buildings and we we connect the two that are physically, their location is, is closest to one another uh, for those programs. Okay. It uh, looks like Trin wants to know, how do you arrange the first initial meeting between the mentor and the mentee? How does that, how, what's the structure behind that first meeting? We do a number of activities uh, during what we call our match meeting because it's a large group uh, that are coming together and then meeting as individual matches and we set up uh, a number of activities that they do that allow, the, for the first three weeks actually, allow that relationship to develop and grow. And some of those activities are as simple as interviewing each one another. Some of them are, are um, activities that allow the two to work together to create a project, but just working to develop that initial relationship over the first three or four weeks. And those activities define by developing that relationship. Okay. You know, I'll just mention an answer to that question. The Search Institute actually has a very nice resource called, I believe it's called Mentoring for Meaningful Results. And that actually has a number of worksheets in it that 
um, mentors and mentees can kind of fill out together. So the mentor would answer a series of questions, the mentee would answer a series of questions, and then they kind of compare their answers. And it's designed for adults working with youth, but I think it could easily be adapted for peer mentors as well. And so and Ashley wants to know, is there a specific tool that you use to measure developmental assets and or risk and protective factors? The risk and protective factors uh, survey is one that we use school-wide, and we don't do it individually with our programs. We measure that result against the rest of the school, which uh, helps us uh, to get better results, we think, in, in using a control group. So that tool is one that uh, that is out there and available for people to use. Our asset uh, survey is one that our national organization has developed for us, and, and we measure on 21 developmental assets. And that is uh, a tool that the teachers fill out, and it measures the change in those assets uh, in each individual participant. As I said, we do it pre and post. Okay, thanks. You know, I think that's one of the struggles for programs is finding, uh, you know, validated evaluation instruments that they can just kind of take and use. And I just want to throw this out there for all the participants. If you're looking for a specific tool that measures, say, self-esteem or feelings of school connectedness, uh, go ahead and, and give uh, the MRC a call or send me an email. And um, there's a couple of good resources out there that really list all the available evaluation tools for folks. So. Uh, uh, feel free to, to contact us. Uh, Mike, if I could add to that, too, we have a self-efficacy tool that we have been using that I'd be willing to, to share with people afterwards, too. Oh, great. Great, great. Thank you, Tina. Uh, Patty wants to know, uh, your training outline was great, but it seems like it would be hard to fit all that in during one two-hour session. So do you break these up into multiple sessions, or, or how do you kind of structure that? We have been able to fit uh, most of the materials within that, but there are times when we have a group, a particular group, that is moving through the process slower and, and will um, add an additional day in, uh, the following week to follow up on the rest of those materials. Uh, Jessica wrote in. She just wanted to say thanks for the training and, and to let you know that uh, your emphasis on choosing disconnected youth uh, is something that they're definitely going to be doing in the future. So thank you for sharing thank you, that. Uh, Valerie wanted to know, are the mentors formally evaluated or only informally evaluated through the teacher report cards? Um, if they're evaluated through the report cards, are the results shared with the mentor? Clarify, our, our, do we collect grades and attendance on our high school students? Well, I think you'd also mentioned the report cards that you use as part of your relationship with the school, and so she might be asking about that as well. We do. We do a school-wide report card. We don't break it down between the high school and the elementary. Um, however, we do break down the report card to the individual school. So we don't give one that is for the whole agency to an individual school. We give their individual one. And we do provide an overall result um, to our high school students, so they'll see that you know, 56% uh, of the kids involved in the program improve their grades. Um, we don't provide individual results of their particular mentee to them, no. Okay. Uh, Janice wants to know, what are some interactive activities that can be used for diversity training? I know you mentioned the cross the line exercise. Maybe you could explain it a little bit more about how that works and then if there's anything else that you use um, to kind of get at those differences between the youth and your program. Uh, the crossing the line activity uh, puts uh, the whole group on, on one side of the room with the facilitator having a, uh, a drawn line down the middle of the room that uh, different questions are asked about uh, different traits or individual characteristics that if that is your particular one, you would cross over that line. And it allows people to be able to look at differences and similarities and be able to process their feelings about being the one or two people in a group of 40 that cross that line and, and how people felt about um, that difference or that um, being the only individuals on that side. It's very, very good to do with high school students. I recommend you tailor the questions uh, directly to that population. 
a couple of the other tools that we have been using um, have come out of our uh, our backgrounds in social work, and they've really come from our local uh, college institutions that are training social workers in um, homes and uh, and diversity. And those tools are ones that ask a lot of questions that are are value laden questions and allow the participant to keep their own answers to themselves, but evaluate how what their feelings that were on those different situations. It's a, a very personal exercise that is done and one that uh, we reflect back on the information that's given to us. So reach out to your local social work institutions. I think they can, uh, uh, colleges, the campuses around you can be able to provide you some support in those areas. Okay. Uh, looks like we've reached the top of the hour. We have a lot of questions still waiting, and I think we're going to keep going for about five more minutes here and try and get through as many of your questions as possible. But for those of you that have other things going on in your busy schedule today, you can go ahead and, and log off, and we thank you for your participation today. We want to be respectful of everyone's time, but you know, we've got a lot of questions in the queue for you, team Miss. so let's go ahead and, and keep rolling for about five minutes more, if that's all right with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fabian wants to know, do you have any information about peer mentoring in which middle school students are mentors for K through third grade students? We, we do not. We uh, have been approached a number of times about having the middle school student uh, be mentored by the high school student. We just find a tremendous amount of risk in that possibility, so we have steered away from that. We've developed specifically a program for our middle school population um, that is an after school activity that's involving adult mentors. So for our, our students, they can become involved um, as a mentee, as a mentee in middle school to, with an adult and then move into high school as a mentor, keeping that uh, consistency along the way for us to have them involved in programs. I'm, I'm not personally familiar with any um, information about a middle school mentor. And Fabian, I do know there are a few guidebooks out there on programs that are, uh, I've seen ones that are for within an elementary school, the, the sixth graders, fifth graders, the older elementary students kind of helping the, the kids a few grades younger. And I know that those programs mostly focus on kind of group projects, group activities, and some one-on-one -on -one kind of tutoring. Um, I don't know how much they get into the youth actually helping the younger kids work through problems and discussing issues. I think that's probably a little too much to ask of uh, a middle school or student or a sixth grader, but there are some resources out there. So if you want to email me after this, I'd be happy to, to let you know what those are. Uh, Brooke wants to know, and this is a question I had, Tina, who are your typical school liaisons? Are they paid by your program or are they strictly volunteer? And my question is, what advice would you have to programs that don't have a Big Brothers agency working in a school, if it was a school itself that wanted to, to just implement this? So who, who do you recommend serves as a liaison or a site coordinator? Our liaisons uh, vary tremendously. Um, the, the most successful uh, are the people who have a real uh, understanding and, and breathe who the kids are in the schools. Um, those have been school counselors, um, school social worker, parent liaisons. We have some school districts that the assistant principals are liaisons. It really varies dependent upon um, the outline that we have provided for the school administration and who they choose. One, who has the time, affordability to do that. And two, um, because as for us, as we've said, it's an in-kind donation for, for the school. Um, that they're able to find um, some stipend or support to that. We have been designated often in schools as a club. So club facilitators within school districts are provided uh, a stipend to be able to run that club. Okay. Uh, Jessica wants to know, and I think there's some big information soon to come out on this, do you have any information on the success rates of peer-to-peer -peer matches versus uh, you know, adult to youth matches. Yeah, the uh, information, as Mike said, is, is coming out from the public-private venture uh, uh, study that was done. 
Um, it uh, is not going to be flattering uh, for the peer uh, program, sadly, very, very sadly to me. Um, it, uh, it was a study that was done using a number of different models and not one specific one. That as, as Mike talked about, we're working uh, with our national organization to look at what are the models that are successful, what are the peer mentoring programs that, that really work. I know, too, that um, uh, Michael Karcher yes. has done a tremendous amount of work in the peer mentoring studies, the research on that, um, and would be able to have some information about it you, you could use to support grants. Yeah, Michael, uh, Dr. Karcher wrote a, for the National Mentoring Partnership Mentor. Uh, he actually last year wrote a, uh, a brief little thing in their research and action series on cross-age peer mentoring. And in there, he discusses that there's a little bit of research out there that shows that uh, peer mentors can be at least as effective, if not maybe a little bit more effective, um, than adult-to-youth mentors. And I think some of that has to do with um, you know, the closeness in age, there's a little bit more of identification, but I think a lot of it really has to do with what the matches are allowed to do in the school setting. I think sometimes peer matches get a little bit more freedom in terms of, uh, you know, their access to school resources and things like that. So I don't think it's black and white that, you know, adults are better in the schools or peer mentoring is better in the schools. I think it's kind of there's a whole host of program factors, you know, how well the matches are supervised, what they're encouraged to do, uh, the mission and the whole tenor of the program. Um, so, you know, and I know that this, this new Big Brothers Big Sisters study, when it comes out, is really going to point to the things that Tina mentioned today, um, recruiting the right kids in the first place, giving them the proper context and training before they're matched. And so I think the research that is coming out, you know, while well, Tina mentioned it may not be flattering right off the bat for the peer-to-peer -peer model, um, it's definitely highlighting the program practices that will um, lead to greater success. So it's, it's valuable research uh, anyway. If, uh, I, if I could just piggyback on that just with one more thing. We, um, we have found that the, men, the kids that are involved in our school-based program as mentees are typically kids that would not become involved in a community-based match. Just based on the parent support that's needed in a community-based match, this program is very simple and it just requires the parent permission and for us to set up a transportation in that after school time frame. So very little parent involvement in kids that we typically would not be serving. Okay. Uh, Ruby wanted to know if copies of the interactive training activities would be made available. And the answer is um, yes to some of them. Um, most of what uh, Tina talked about today are available in, in handbooks that either the National Mentoring Center has put out or a few of them come from the Mentoring Resource Center. And when we go ahead and send out the final handouts and slides and everything from today, um, we'll be sure to include as many of those as we have the permission and the ability to, uh, to put out. Um, but one of the things I also wanted to mention is, is that we have a guidebook on cross-age peer mentoring coming out, and that has two big lists in it of resources that are available to people. One is a, a listing of books that have training content, training activities that you can use with peer mentors. The other is a listing of, of books that are available that have activity ideas for your matches to do together. So if you really wanted to, say, work with your matches on uh, dealing with bullying, um, there will be a listing of, of books that, you know, you can kind of find ready-to-use activities that can get your matches either as groups or individually talking about, you know, things like bullying or peer pressure or, or whatnot. So I think that guide that's going to be coming out um, will be very helpful in that. So let's go ahead and take one more question here before we, we hit the road. Uh, the questions that we didn't get to today, we're going to have Tina and, and our staff type up some answers to them, and we will also be sharing those. So if we didn't get to your question today, uh, my apologies, but, but we will get you an answer. Uh, the last question here is Megan wants to know, how do you decide which kids serve with an adult mentor or which kids might benefit more from having a peer mentor? That uh, has been a challenge for our staff many times. Uh, we have kids that are in an area 
that are referred to the program, both uh, because we have a staff person doing school and a staff person doing community, it isn't until they get into the database that we recognize that we have a, a child who could be matched in both places. So we had to put some uh, uh, systems in place so that that wouldn't happen in the staff not talking to one another about that specific school. But typically, um, the school-based matches that that we have, they they meet um, a developmental criteria in looking what the parents are looking for based on the application. So parents will provide for us uh, information about what they would like to have, um, their interest in the program, and their interest in and. Uh, hopes in getting their their ment mentors, so that helps to screen it. Um, the developmental uh, capacities of the of the little uh, helps us to screen that. And the third thing is life experiences, things that have happened in that home or in uh, in the situations around the school that child the needs that they have both emotionally um, and perhaps physically help to determine whether that would be more appropriate to be matched with a high school or with a adult mentor. Okay. Well thank you, Tina. It looks like that's about all the time we've got today. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and wrap things up. First of all, I want to thank Tina. Uh, you were wonderful today. Thank you for all the helpful advice and insights. Um, and you know, as I mentioned, if you have questions for Tina or our staff, um, we're going to be going through the list of ones that we didn't get to here in person today, and we'll be providing a, a list of, of those questions and answers um, after the fact here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be sending out an evaluation um, shortly along with those handouts, and we thank you in advance for, for filling that out. Uh, also, as I mentioned, a recorded version of this should be available soon, and we'll let everybody know via email when that is, is up and, and ready. And I also just want to remind those of you that are Department of Ed grantees that the MRC is here to help you with anything related to setting up or improving the peer mentoring program. So uh, if you've got questions or other needs, be sure to be in contact with us. And obviously, the, the LEARNS project is available uh, to provide that same support to those of you who are working with Corporation for National and Community Service Programs. So I think that's it for today. I want to thank all of you for participating and sending in your great questions. And uh, I wish you best of luck with your cross-age peer mentoring programs as you move forward. So have a good day, everybody, and, and best of luck. Thanks.